Hello everyone, James Markham again with another Biblical Prescription for Life. And in this series, I wanted to really talk about, in a short period of time, not bogging you down with too much data, but give you a basic framework for stents, specifically Stenting 101, what is a stent, who might benefit, who might not benefit. Um, this is a very controversial subject, and I wanted to weigh in and give you my opinion. In our last video, we basically showed about what a stent was. We showed some pictures of a stent going in the artery, and basically a stent relieves blockages, so there's more blood flow, so that organ gets blood, so it can function appropriately. There's risk of the procedure but it has gotten more advanced and technology has developed through the years. Today, we're gonna to talk about a little bit of a tougher issue, and I'm gonna give you my perspective as I've seen this evolve over many, many decades now as a cardiologist. Remember, I was around before they had angioplasty, before they had bare metal stents, before they had drug-eluting stents, so I've sort of seen all of this evolve over time. Um, and I'll tell you, what we have today is definitely been better than what we had when I started as far as treatment and different options. But the best treatment we can have is that, that spiritual treatment, that healing that comes from Christ and accepting his love and his sacrifice for us. With that in mind, I want to start us out today with the biblical prescription, and that's Matthew 24, verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. These are Christ's words talking about the gospel. That's the good news. That's the healing news. That's why we do this biblical prescription is to point people to the real truth. That modern medicine has its place, um, but the real hope for all of us is this gospel. And we want to spread this gospel, preach it, live it, tell everyone in all the world about it, whichever platform they might get it. Hopefully some will get it from this platform and want to learn more. Um, we want to do this, and then we're going to have healing. When the end comes to this earth, we're not going to have to put up with some of the, the maladies that we have. We can have um, perfect peace, and there's always hope in that. So with that in mind, let's delve into this topic today about who should undergo a stent. And before we do that, I think a little framework about what the problem is will help us as we understand this, because there's a lot of misinformation out there about this, and I want to give my perspective. So remember, um, our problem is blockages in the arteries or damage to the endothelium. When the endothelium damages, it becomes inflamed, it wants to clot, blood can't get through. Sometimes it looks like this, where it gradually gets fat and proteins and inflammatory fibers and all of this over time. And then sometimes, most of the time, it comes from little disruptions. We call that an unstable plaque. You don't even pick that up with an angiogram or stress test. In fact, most heart attacks come from these small plaques that become unstable. When they become unstable, they sort of like a volcano, they rupture, blood clots, no blood can flow down the arteries. Um, the heart doesn't get enough blood. When it doesn't get enough blood, it can have dangerous arrhythmias. Um, the muscle doesn't work as well. The valve doesn't work as well. Of course, people have pain and they have shortness of breath. Those are some of the symptoms that they might have. So when we say a person has one vessel coronary disease or two vessel coronary disease, what we're really referring to are these are the worst ones that we can see. In actuality, the endothelium is damaged or compromised throughout the body. 
And that's very important to know because most heart attacks happen from arteries that aren't very blocked at all. They're just damaged. They have these plaques that become unstable. In fact, William Clifford Roberts, he's a pathologist that did many autopsy studies for over 50 years. And he looked and he found out that this atherosclerosis, this coronary disease, it's just not one vessel or two vessel. This is a disease that goes throughout all of the blood vessels. And in looking at the arteries that go around the heart, and if you think about the coronary arteries, there's only about 11 inches of, of arteries that go around the heart. They actually did pathological specimens where they cut them into small um, sizes and looked at them under the microscope. And they found that disease, to some degree, was in all of the blood vessels that would not even be picked up with our typical imaging, which is angiograms and CAT scans. So I think that's very useful information as we think about who would benefit from a stent and who would not benefit from a stent. And over my 30 years plus, there's been numerous studies. Because remember, I started out before we had a stent. And definitely, we used to give the lytics to break open these blockages. And there was a lot of, you know, it was better than nothing. But a lot of people had bleeding problems. A lot of the times, it didn't work. Then we moved to the where we just had the balloon only, where they did the angioplasty. And we had, it helped better than nothing, especially for a heart attack, um, but, but it wasn't the end all. It had lots of problems with restenosis, damage to blood vessels. Then we moved to the, we talked about this last time, the bare metal stents, and now finally the drug eluding stents. So now we're trying to sort through who this is beneficial to the most, knowing that this this is, is we just treat a symptom, we don't really get at the disease, which is damage to the endothelium all over. And I've done some videos in the past about endothelium. You might wanna watch that about ways you can keep the endothelium healthy. Well, there's been many different trials through the years. And back in 2007, there was the COURAGE trial. And one of my mentors, Dr. Robert O'Rourke, um, he taught me when I was at school at the University of Texas, he was one of the investigators, and this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And they looked and they really didn't found a large benefit um, in treating with this type of technology in people with stable disease. That's, they have disease, but it's stable. They're not having a heart attack. They're not having active chest pain. They're not having organ or dysfunction. They've done other studies also with that. The MACE studies looked at this. And not too long ago, they did this trial called the Orbiter trial. And that was very interesting. And that was published in The Lancet in 2018. They didn't look at a lot of people on this study. But what they did was they did some people and they wanted to see how long did it, um, how long could they exercise with this disease before having symptoms in the chest? Because if you think about it, um, the artery supplies the muscle. And if we don't get enough blood to the muscle, it hurts. We have a symptom. We call that angina. How long would it take? And in this study, they did what they call a sham study. They pretended that they helped revascularize people or bring blood supply to the area, and they didn't do anything. And they still found that those people improved as well. So I think if anything else, this study in the lands, it sort of taught me that there is um, a belief system, um, a placebo effect when someone thinks something's being done that it helps them. So the mind is involved in all of this. And I think that's an important factor to keep in the back of our minds as we decide whether these procedures, which do carry risk, whether the risks are worth the benefits. Then I guess one of the most recent trials came out and that was the ischemic trial. And, um, and when they were presenting this ischemic trial, the real issue that that I stated is, you know, some of the most common invasive heart procedures that we've talked about, the stenting, are no better at preventing heart attacks and deaths in patients 
with stable heart disease than pills and lifestyle improvements alone, according to this ischemia, which was a massively funded study. So they looked at it. It was called the ischemia study. Um, it was published, and they basically found no difference in a constellation of major heart disease outcomes, and this the outcomes including death, heart attacks, heart-related hospitalizations, and resuscitations, there was no benefit to an invasive strategy. That's where we go in and put stents and do procedures, in, in procedures including bypass, in patients without chest pain. So again, this brought up the controversy that maybe we're, a lot of these procedures, and we do a lot of these every year in the United States, maybe some of these we don't need to be doing. So this ischemia trial basically showed that this early invasive approach of putting a stent did not protect the patient against death or overall chance of heart attack. It does not even effectively relieve chest pain in many people. Um, however, there is a group of people that they did find that it helped improve their symptoms. Um, so this has been under a lot of talk. Um, it's one of the appropriate use of stents is one of the most heated debates in medication today. As coronary disease affects millions and millions of people, we do lots of stents every year. It's a big business. And nowadays, they've, we sort of accustom the way people think. If you go and have a stress test today, it's abnormal stress test, um, it seems like there's a rush to schedule you, even if you're stable, to move forward with stenting or bypass because everyone's afraid of an imminent risk of heart attack or sudden death. Well, this study, ischemia, as well as the other ones, really didn't support this viewpoint. And there's over 500,000 stent procedures done a year. So one of the, the trial leaders of this um, from New York University, um, Lagone Health said in an interview that researchers spent considerable time trying to decide how to respond to the critiques and misinformation that would come from this. Because this was an unprecedented trial um, and also the trial is still ongoing. So they're still coming up with data from this trial, but I wanted to talk to you today we wanted to talk about stents were and who benefits the most from stents, who might not benefit, and how do you make a decision? Well, first, I want to encourage you to pray, find a good balance, and it takes good information to make good decisions. And remember, every study, every trial out there doesn't apply to everyone. Each individual is unique, both in their belief system, their genetics, and their anatomy. So you must have to talk to your physician about the risk and benefits of all of this. But this study, the ischemia study, the orbiter trial, say it's not unreasonable if you have stable disease to try to get at the cause. Because remember, this is disease that goes throughout the blood vessels. Now, I could talk on and on about all of this, but I'm just gonna give you my opinion today about who benefits. If you're having a heart attack or an acute event, you benefit. Um, it's better to have an artery open than closed. The sooner you get that artery open, the sooner the blood supply, the less chance of having complications. I can remember the days when we give thrombolytics, hoping to open up the arteries and they didn't and we had lots of complications. Um, it wasn't a very good site. I wish I had more to offer. So an acute event, that's someone that's having a heart attack, pain that won't go away, EKG abnormal, abnormal blood work, or people that are having an unstable coronary syndrome. So symptoms that are leading up to that. Realizing that if they find the culprit vessel, that might help the immediate problem, but doesn't turn off this disease, which is everywhere. We wanna do those things as well. So if you're having an acute problem, you're having a symptom right now, you need help. I also think 
from my experience that it's good for certain high risk medical conditions. And your doctors can talk to you about those certain high risk conditions. Um, the studies so far have looked at all different sort of conditions and say it's safe to manage it with medicines and lifestyle, doesn't prevent heart attack, but there might be some certain high risk conditions that your doctor might say, yes, for you, a stent would be worth the risk. Are there risks? Yes, there are. Let's review those a little bit today. We talked about them last time, but the risk of getting a stent is bleeding because you have to take blood thinners for a long period of time. There is a risk of vascular damage. So if you damage a blood vessel, the other blood vessels in the body can become more unstable with inflammation. That's why you have to take blood thinners. There's a chance that the procedure itself will damage a blood vessel. Um, it could cause a vascular complication. Some of those we call dissections. We have clots. Sometimes it can cause strokes. The dye itself can cause a damage to the kidneys. These aren't huge risk, but they've estimated that as many as two in 100 will have that type of risk. So, so it is a procedure that carries risk. Who else might benefit from having a stenting procedure? Someone that has a belief system. Some people I talk to, they believe that if they have a blockage, it's gonna to lead to a heart attack and a stent will prevent that. Even though the research does not support that, they believe it with all their hearts. You cannot convince them that this disease is a systemic disease and most disease come from these unstable. So their belief system is so strong that they think that it helps them. Those people might benefit. Also, some people will see and receive a stent, maybe from a blockage that could be managed conservatively and they'll change their lifestyle they'll see that they need to get at the cause of the problem. So for those people, the benefits might be worth the risk. And unfortunately, in all of those studies, we haven't studied these things. We also haven't looked at how technology has evolved and improved. Placing the stents have improved. The drug eluding stents have improved. Um, things have improved. And also, we haven't looked at people's belief systems and some people just want a quick fix when they're having pain. But for many people, a large number of people do not need to have stenting. They can benefit from having lifestyle changes. They can benefit from nutritional changes. They can benefit from medications which slow the heart rate, deal with cholesterol, and do all of these things. In fact, this needs to be explored more, especially in arteries that are low risk. Remember, it's not the blockage. It's well that the arteries are getting bigger. And just because you have a blockage doesn't mean it's going to become unstable and you have a heart attack. I worry more about the patients that have maybe mild disease and they don't even know it. That plaque will become rupture. They'll have an acute heart attack and they won't get symptoms right away. But in stable coronary disease, this has been proved to be um, a way to treat it without having some of the complications that come from stents, especially when you're not having an acute event. If you have a stable stress test, if some of these other events are not occurring. So I definitely think it's worth talking to your doctor about whether you think a stent would benefit you in your situation, knowing that there's many studies out there that have now showed that in stable coronary disease, where you just have a blockage, even if it's a significant blockage, there's lifestyle things that have now been shown. Dr. Esselstyn, Dr. Ornish, there's been others that have shown that we can improve the coronary health by getting at the cause. And that's improving the endothelium, getting fat out of the body, exercising, where we improve the endothelium by the motion of the blood, um, cholesterol medications when appropriate, lowering the blood pressure, medicines that help with angina, helping your belief system, knowing when to get help. So this is a discussion that's going to continue going on, but the ischemia study is yet another large study that shows if a person's stable, they're not having symptoms, an acute coronary event, they can be managed medically 
And I think that's reasonable depending on a person's belief systems and all of these other variables that we cannot cover in these studies. So it's gotta be individual lies, but I do agree that through time, we probably put in more stents than we needed to, but I'm so glad that we do have this technology to help people that are acutely ill that have unstable situations. And lots of times in my patients, I've seen them that they, they, they have to have it so that they get the stent, but they are able to gradually work on the cause of the disease, which is endothelial dysfunction. What can we do to improve the endothelium? How can we put less stress on the endothelium, improve our nutrition, our blood pressure, all of these other factors that we've talked about? I don't want to encourage you to go back and look at some of the videos we've made in the past on endothelium. So I hope this gives you a good perspective about who should have a stent, what a stent is, Talk to your doctor about the variables for you, realizing that we have in our country a little bit of a stent bias. We tend to put it in. A lot of it's because everyone wants to have a quick fix. Many people do not want to have a lifestyle change. And many people honestly say, listen, I'm going to do what I want as long as I want. I just want the easiest thing right now. I don't want to have to do all of these things to get at the cause of disease. But I think everyone deserves to have as much information as they can to make good decisions. Everyone needs to have these options. And now yet in this study, the ischemia study saying that we can manage coronary disease, even significant coronary disease, if it's not causing acute symptoms just as well with lifestyle as medications and maybe get it to cause better than we could by putting in stents and having aggressive procedures. That's for chronic stable disease. So talk to your doctor about what situation might work for you and do everything you can to slow down the development of endothelial disease in your body. But more important than all of that is our scripture today, Matthew 24, um, verse 14. And this gospel, the good news, the healing that Christ came to give us, that we can be healed perfectly someday of the kingdom, will be preached. And I'm hoping that we are doing this today, emphasizing how important biblical prescriptions are all in all the world. Not just here, but everyone's going to hear about this good news, this healing news. We're going to take our focus over all the problems we have here and look on the big picture as a witness to all the nations and then when that comes, Christ, our healer, will come and take us home. And we're going to have, we're going to have just such a wonderful experience, such joy. We can't even imagine this. But that's what we want to keep our eyes focused on. So I hope this helped you a little bit, understanding a little bit more about stents. If you like it, give us a thumbs up. Share it with your friends and neighbors. There's going to be more talk about this. Um, as time goes on, there's lots of people that say we shouldn't do it on anybody unless they're having a heart attack. Other people will say, hey, listen, there's, there's, we got to meet people where they're at with their belief systems, with their complex anatomy. Uh, and I think that's sort of where I've been meeting my patients, letting them understand it's safe not to do anything if you're not having symptoms. If you're having symptoms, you have to get help. And then we want to do everything we can to reverse disease. And I've had lots of people that we've had disease reversal that doing these lifestyle changes through the years. And I really applaud those that are out there on the forefront promoting lifestyle changes, promoting plant-based diets, promoting you know people's belief systems, um, exercise, those type of things that get at the core of the problem to maybe obviate the need for this. But I also understand that in this world of the modern media and marketing and hearing something over and over and people wanting quick fixes to all their problems, it's easy to go down this pathway that we've done. And now we're trying to realize Line it. But I'm just glad the technology continues to get better. We continue to have these discussions. We can continue to make decisions based on freedom. Um, and we, can, we have the ability to look at all the variables and then make a situation based on risk and benefits. So 
I hope to be back soon with yet another biblical prescription for life. Um, thanks for joining me, and I'm wishing you the best of health.